2014. This is a special, and I mean very special, meeting of the Los Angeles Board of Police Commissioners. We would like to extend our gratitude to the Recreation and Parks Department for the use of Green Meadows Rec Center. Where are the Rec and Parks staffers that are here? Can you guys raise your hands? They're all working. Well, we thank them. Oh, specifically Louise Merritt, who's director of the center. Is Louise here or no? Okay, when she comes in, we'll say hi. And for all their help, and Captain Tingaridi's Southeast Division for all their assistance. Philip, sir. A special thank you to the Southeast cadets who will be assisting tonight, all of whom I've spoken with this evening and promise to do a great job like they always do. Um, I guess uh, before we ask uh, um, Council Member Curran Price to say a few words, Madam Secretary, will you please call the roll? Good evening. Let the record reflect. Commissioners Soboroff, Figueroa Villa, Madison, and Saltzman are present, and we have a quorum. Mr. President, would you like me to go to uh, number one? or uh, uh, Do we do, want to do comments for a sec? Yes. Okay. Uh, is there comments? On, in, on commission the comments, okay. item number one. On commission comments, I'd like the commissioners to introduce themselves to you and tell you a little a bit about themselves. And also, I would like the same with the um, city attorney, with the uh, inspector general, and with, uh, with Richard uh, Tfank, the executive director of the police commission. I want you to see the people that, and chief is here. Um, and uh, the people that are here working for you tonight. So let's start with, let's start to the left with uh, Commissioner Figueroa Villa. Hi, good evening. My name is Sandra Figueroa Villa, and I was appointed by Mayor Garcetti to the Police Commission. I was born and raised in South LA. I still live in Los Angeles, um, never wanted to leave LA. Uh, in my daily life, I run a nonprofit um, in, that works with children, youth, and families. Um, it's in the Echo Park area, but we also have a site here in Limart Park. So we work with a lot of families in this neighborhood. Um, I have had great experience and still learning about what it is that we do as a commission but I am here representing community and I'm here to serve you so um, I have cards if you want to come up you want to email me uh, please do so after the meeting thank you uh, Commissioner Saltzman and we'll go to the vice president go ahead okay. uh, thank you my name is Rob Saltzman uh, I've lived in Los Angeles since 1980. And uh, during the day, I work at USC. I'm a law professor and an associate dean at the law school. Uh, I've served on the police commission for about seven years now. I was appointed originally by Mayor Villaraigosa and then continued by Mayor Garcetti. And my goal here tonight is to listen, to learn, and uh, take what we learned back to what we do uh, every day. Thank you. Commissioner Madison. Good evening. My name is Paula Madison, and I am uh, not a native of Los Angeles, but I'm happy to live here and never intend to leave. I'm a native of Harlem. I moved to Los Angeles back in 2000 when uh, I worked for NBC, and I was named president and general manager of KNBC Channel 4. We then purchased, our company then purchased the Telemundo Network, and I was also the general manager for, the regional general manager for the two then Telemundo stations, KVEA and KWHY. Um, I um, presently am retired. I've been retired for three years from NBC Universal, uh, but that means that I spend a lot of time focusing on, on things that I'm interested in, and when the mayor asked me to consider serving as a police commissioner, I jumped at the opportunity, jumped so fast that I neglected to actually get the buy-in of my husband. Um, but when I got home and explained to him, and he certainly understood why, uh, it's important to have a voice and a voice representing uh, people of color for certain on the commission. Uh, presently, I am, um, I've been showing a film, a documentary about my family's history. Um, my grandfather was Chinese family comes from Jamaica, and uh, 
I have traced my family's history back to 1006 BC. So although on the African side I am Ashanti, on the other side I am Hakka of China. It's very nice to meet you. I'll be around for a little after the meeting and we look forward to hearing all of your comments. Thank you. City Attorney. Good evening, my name is Carlos De La Guerra. I'm an assistant city attorney and I've been an advisor to the police department for about 13 years. You're a lot more than that. <laughs> How about a little bit about your background? <laughs> All right, I, I grew up in LA, the Echo Park area. I went to Belmont High School and um, I went to Loyola Law School. I've been an attorney for about 21 years now. So. Great. Mr. T. Fank. Good evening. Uh, Richard T. Fank. I'm the Executive Director for the Board of Police Commissioners. I've had that position uh, in December. It'll be 11 years. Uh, as the Executive Director, my responsibility is to act as the Chief Executive for the Board of Police Commissioners, administer their affairs, liaison on behalf of the Board of Police Commissioners with the uh, elected offices of the Mayor, the City Council members, and also with the Chief Administrative Officer and the Chief Legislative Officer of the City, as well as with the Chief of Police and his staff to ensure that the directions of the Board of Police Commissioners and et cetera are carried out by the Department. I manage all the affairs of our Commission office. We have a staff of approximately 65 people. Within that office, a bulk of that responsibility is within Commission Investigation Division, and a large part of that is the administration of uh, police commission permits, the monitoring of official police garage uh, contracts, and one of our bigger areas of concern is we monitor parking lots to ensure that parking lots have the appropriate police commission permit in, in conjunction with the Office of Finance, pay the appropriate tax that they collect when you park a car at the City of Los Angeles. The money you give is 10% of that is a city tax, and they are supposed to remit that to the city. We ensure that they do that, and if they do not, there are processes that we go through both administratively and criminally to uh, ensure that that is done. My background, I retired as a uh, law enforcement officer in 2001. I had 33 years as a police officer, 15 of those years as a police chief. I was a police chief in the city of Pomona for three years and a police chief in the city of Buena Park in Orange County for 12 years, so 15 of my 33 years as a, as a police chief. Uh, after retiring as a police chief, I went to work for Bill Lockyer, who was then the Attorney General for the state of California as his law enforcement liaison. I did that for two and a half years prior to my employment with the City of Los Angeles. Thank you. Um, listen up very carefully now uh, when, you, uh, when Mr. Sibley introduces uh, himself and talks about the office of the Inspector General. See if you can pick up the... Um, Texas accent that he has. Mr. Sibley. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So, um, yes, uh, as, the, as the President alluded to, I've got a little bit of a different accent. I'm not an L.A. native, um, although I have lived here for 15 years and uh, very much uh, consider this place my home. I'm originally from England, where uh, once upon a time I was a, a bobby in the uh, English police service, um, but for the last 11 years almost, I've been um, with the Office of the Inspector General, and I'm currently serving as uh, an Assistant Inspector General, and my role in the office is to head the use of force section, and so the section that I manage uh, looks at the investigations of all serious uses of force involved in the Los Angeles Police Department, so that would include officer-involved shootings, um, in-custody deaths, uses of force that result in serious injury, or, or uses of force that have the potential to cause serious injury. Um, in that capacity, uh, me and my staff look at every single incident that falls into those, into those categories. We make sure that the investigations are very thorough. And then at the end of the process, we make sure that the commission is provided with a thorough analysis of both the investigation and of the incident itself. And we provide the commission, which is the, de the decision-making body, as to whether or not those uses of force were within department policy with advice, along with advice that's provided to them by the chief of police so that they can make a, a well-informed decision on, on every single case that they review. In addition to my section, um, within the uh, Inspector General's office, we have a complaint section, an audit section, which looks at the LAPD's work in investigating itself through its uh, internal affairs uh, group and also audits uh, various 
uh, functions within the Los Angeles Police Department and reports on all of those matters to the Board of Police Commissioners so that the Board can be well informed in its oversight of the, uh, of the Police Department. And we also have a section called uh, which is uh, named the Special Investigations and Compliance Section, which looks at various issues within the Police Department and again reports those issues to the Board of Police Commissioners. And the work of those three sections together, which is overseen by the Inspector General who I'm representing tonight, Mr. Alexander Bustamante, who's actually out of town today, um, those reports will all provide the Commission with the information that they need uh, to have an independent source of uh, information on the inner functionings of the, of the Police Department and in that way we support their role as the oversight body for the Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, Chief, you have time on the uh, agenda to give your normal report, but I think it'd be interesting for people to hear about your background in the department and before the department and your history all over the department. Chief? Well, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. President, and, and uh, welcome <coughs> to everyone that is here. Uh, thank you for being here. This is an important part of the management of the Los Angeles Police Department to hear input from you and then to, uh, to have that input go directly to the Police Commission. I was born and raised in the uh, Los Angeles area. My dad was a Los Angeles police officer uh, for 30 years. He retired in 1980. Uh, my sister was a Los Angeles police detective. I have several cousins that were Los Angeles police officers. And I have two children that are Los Angeles police officers, one of whom is working tonight in uniform in 77th, the division to the north. Uh, I have been a uh, Los Angeles police officer uh, coming next year for 40 years. Uh, I have spent the majority of my time uh, as a, uh, in uniform assignments in this very division. Uh, I was a police officer in Southeast, I was a sergeant in Southeast, I was a lieutenant in Southeast, and I was a captain in Southeast. And all those were assignments that I sought out uh, on, of my own volition because I think policing in, in this community is very important and part of the fabric uh, that, uh, that can make a difference in people's lives. Uh, I was the chief of South Bureau, uh, which uh, Commander Green, I mean, excuse me, Chief Green is now. Uh, he will give a report later, but uh, this, uh, this community is my heart. This community is, uh, is where I've chosen to spend uh, most of my career, up until the time I became Chief of Police. Thank you. Um, I was a um, Parks Commissioner, so I've been in this community and these parks uh, for, for many, many years. Um, involved with the uh, LAUSD in the implementation of the school bond to try and take some money and, and uh, the administration had ideas of where they wanted to spend the money to fix up the schools and instead of that we went out to meetings just like this and asked the people where the money should be spent, not the administrators, and asked the, the people that worked at the schools where the money should be spent. Um, um, so uh, uh, this is an important community to me. That's why we're here. And I think that you're extremely fortunate to have as your council member um, a, a friend of all of yours and a friend of ours and a gentleman that I would like to introduce. I'm very jealous of his education. He's Stanford educated. I don't know what his grades were at Stanford, but at least he went to Stanford. Current Price. Thank you. Good evening. Mr. Mr. President, uh, commissioners, staff, chief, men and women of blue, it's a real honor and pleasure to welcome you to, to, to the 9th District. Uh, and I want to just applaud the LAPD for hosting the meeting here. Uh, it doesn't happen all the time. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, it's important that residents who often uh, are exposed to, to the uh, greatest concentration of crimes and violence uh, have a chance to meet with their their, their police commission. Uh, and we certainly want to, to demonstrate that the police uh, are here to serve, to protect, to respect, and to listen. And so your presence here is, uh, is very important. Uh, hosting the commission meeting here at this time also works for our hardworking families who have a chance to come out uh, and attend important meetings like this. Uh, and let's be honest here, our community has been uh, through a lot this year. Uh, there's been a growing sense of fear and concern 
uh, because while crime is down, we hear crime is down, crime is down uh, in Los Angeles, it's certainly uh, is not down in our community, uh, at least not down enough. Um, and so we feel that uh, um, more and more every day we're hearing of incidents that impact uh, our community, especially our uh, young men and women of color. Uh, and so it's important that you be here to hear our concerns uh, and for the community to understand the process uh, that, that we work through. I understand the frustration that, that many feel, uh, and I certainly join uh, with others in demanding the full disclosure and transparency on the unfortunate circumstances around the Ezell Ford incident uh, and others that involve police force. <clears throat> I've also been in communication uh, with, the, with the, the top brass, including the chief, uh, about changing the culture of the department, particularly in those divisions within the 9th District, um, and ensuring that they're, they are more culturally sensitive to the community that they are serving. Uh, across the country today, we have had a national conversation about police force and the challenges uh, that communities of color, uh, again, particularly young men of color, face with law enforcement. A few months ago, we had the incidents, uh, the events in Ferguson, Missouri, which focused national attention on the use of force, the targeting of uh, minorities, uh, and governmental transparency, um, and, uh, and problems that arise when there's not an open and full communication. Uh, in response, here in Los Angeles, some of you may recall, we held a town hall meeting, uh, Paradise Baptist Church, uh, President Soberoff was in attendance, the chief uh, was in attendance uh, with his uh, command staff, uh, and I think it certainly helped to open up a uh, level of communication that was very, very important. In fact, next week, uh, on Thursday, October 30th, in the morning of November the 1st, uh, my office is going to be hosting two days of dialogue sessions, uh, again, to discuss community relations in the aftermath of the Ford uh, and the Michael Brown tragedies. As always, our goal is to help us engage in a productive discussion so that we can get facts out, people understand uh, the process, and are satisfied that uh, justice uh, is being uh, done. So uh, again, I would invite uh, commission members, uh, certainly the police, community members, to be a part of uh, that discussion, and we've got some information uh, about it uh, on the door, uh, uh, at the door. Uh, but again, I just want to thank you for hosting uh, the meeting here this evening. I want to thank you for your uh, service on behalf of the citizens of Los Angeles and for your commitment to making sure that uh, everyone feels safe, secure, uh, and at peace here in our community and in our city. Keep up the good work. Congratulations. I want to say two things. First of all, if we all turn around and take a look at the incredible mural that the kids from the community made for us for the evening this evening, and anybody that wants to take a photo or a selfie with that, it's pretty cool. Thank you to the to kids who work so hard on that. Also, our cadets are the Gateway Cadets tonight, and let's give them all a round of applause. Here. Hope that soon that they will be... Uh, members of the Los Angeles Police Department. We can use them. They're terrific. Um, let's go on. Okay, that was item number two on the agenda. We're on now on number three, the report of the Chief of Police, Chief Beck. Good morning again, and I will be uh, brief because I know that uh, the folks in attendance most like to hear from, uh, from Chief Green and from uh, Captain Tingarides about local issues. Uh, Report on Part 1 crime in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, in total, Part 1 crime is down 3.7%. Uh, that's led primarily by a decrease in property crime of 6.2%. Uh, matter of fact, all the four categories that are, that are measured in property crime are down significantly in the city. Uh, homicides are down 6% uh, compared to last year and 16% compared to 2012. We're on pace to have the lowest number of homicides in the city of Los Angeles in, in almost 50 years. Uh, we are suffering a, an increase in uh, sexual assaults. We have a 10% uh, increase in sexual assaults compared to 2013. Uh, that is a, actually a slight reduction compared to 2012, but is a, of extreme concern to us. 
Uh, we also have an increase in aggravated assaults uh, throughout the city, uh, almost a 20% increase. That ag assault number is driven uh, primarily uh, by uh, domestic violence incidents, which have increased uh, by over 1,200 in their most serious category this year. Uh, shootings are down in the city of Los Angeles. A uh, number of victims shot are down 11 percent. Incidents of shots fired are down 8.9 percent. Categorical uses of force, which are the, uh, the, the types of use of force that uh, Mr. Zibley talked about and that the police commission uh, investigates, are down 29.6 percent compared to 2013 uh, and are at the uh, uh, lowest level uh, that, uh, that they have been in at least the past five years. Officer-involved shootings, which of course are the most serious of categorical use of force incidents, are down 36 percent as compared to last year and uh, are similar to categorical use of force in that they are at their lowest level in at least the last five years. Traffic collisions are up slightly in the city, about 3 percent. Uh, it's about 1,000 more traffic collisions than we had this time last year. To give you the idea of the scope of that, that's 36,000 traffic collisions in the city of Los Angeles so far this year. Driving under the influence uh, related traffic accidents are about even, uh, up 0.1 percent. Hit and runs, uh, which are a, a big portion of our um, emphasis this year, are down 1.4 percent in total, uh, but are down 15.6 percent in the most serious cases and uh, fatalities are down an even greater 37 percent. Motor vehicle versus pedestrian accidents, which can be extremely serious, are about even, down 0.2 percent, uh, and motor vehicle versus pedestrian deaths are down 8.1 percent. Bicycle involved traffic accidents are also down uh, 11 percent citywide. Personal statistics, which is also part of my regular report, we have 9,934 uh, police officers, 2,735 civilian personnel. That includes 612 vacant positions that we've been unable to fill. Uh, we have just over 400 reserve officers, 372 specialist volunteers, 45 chaplain counselors, and of particular interest to this community, we have 5,448 cadets. Um, who are uh, uh, led by some of the longer, largest posts that are in this immediate vicinity. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to just take a moment uh, to introduce um, the mother of Sebastian Ridley Thomas and the wife of Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas and the talented and wonderful uh, person who does so much good work for our community and at UCLA, and that is Avis Ridley Thomas. You. Your other son's cool too, but he's not an elected official right now. He's at the Marshall School at UCLA. USC. Oh, at USC. Ooh. The Marshall School. You're covering, I'm sorry, you're covering all the uh, covering all the territory. Well, thank you so much for coming, and send our regards to the family and my sons' regards to your sons because they grew up as buddies for a long time. Okay. Uh, let, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Item number four. Next on the agenda, item number four, the report of the executive director, Mr. T. Fink. Other than what I originally spoke about, uh, Mr. President, just a few items that I would say for the general public information. Uh, the uh, police commission meetings are held every Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. at police headquarters at 100 West 1st Street. Public is welcome to attend those meetings. They also are televised on Channel 35, as this meeting will also be televised. They are not televised live because council meeting takes precedent over our meeting, but they are shown uh, during the week, and you can also access them online, and you can also listen online live to the commission meetings if you choose to do that. Uh, tonight, during public comment, when public comment is, is called by the, the president, uh, there are speaker cards. Uh, officers in the room will have a speaker card. Please fill out a speaker card. Your name will be called, and the board secretary will call you probably in groups of five. The microphone is in the center of the room. If you would line up as your name is called, 
You'll have two minutes to speak under public comment. Uh, under the Brown Act, the Board of Police Commissioners is not able to respond back to you with a question you might ask them. However, I do know that the area captain and a number of officers are in the room who, if you have a law enforcement related issue, service issue, that they'll be more than happy to help you with. And I'm sure Captain Tangredis will make sure that uh, is done. So with that said, that concludes my comments, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, item number five, the report of the Inspector General. Mr. Sibley. Yes, thank you. And I, I really don't have anything to report other than the comments that I made earlier in, uh, in describing the office. Uh, I am looking forward to hearing uh, from the, uh, the public speakers tonight. And one thing I just did want to take the opportunity to do is to invite anybody at any time, if they ever have any questions or concerns that they think that the IG's office can help with, that our office is always uh, available to provide advice or to refer you to the right uh, sources or in some cases to, to uh, conduct investigations. Our telephone number is 213. 482-6833. We're located in downtown at 201 North Figueroa Street, and um, we are always, uh, always very happy to uh, to hear from members of the community and to help in any way that we can. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I do have a question for you. Uh, you were a Bobby in London. I was a Bobby, but not in London, in a city called Hull in and Northern how, England. How do you guys not smile when people come up right in front of you and like make faces? Oh, I, I smiled all the time. That's why I had to leave and come to the United States. <laughs> Kept getting in trouble for smiling. Oh, okay. okay. We do have one public comment card on this item. Well, we have Inspector General. <laughs> we have uh, Jabra Mohammed. Welcome, sir. This is what I was uh, given the impression that we were going to speak on. And uh, given the strain that uh, we have been subjected to as a community, citywide, statewide, nationwide, in terms of the police and the public is concerned, uh, what is a remedy to this? How do we, as the community, interface with the authority so that we can feel that we are part and parcel of creating resolution regarding some of the problems that we're faced with? Okay, now I came up with a program called the Phone Drone Roam Phone Project, and what this does, it gives the, the community an opportunity to put surveillance on administration. It gives the community an opportunity to survey the constabulary, okay? Uh, we're hoping the jobs come from this. And what it does is it gives the cameras. We know how impacted the cameras have been in Rodney and Miss uh, 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 Pinnock and whatnot. And these people will just volunteer their effort in terms of they just so happen to have it. But what we want to do is create a program where people are given the authority to have it. And that when we see a problem situation, we have the authority to step to it and film it. A problem situation may very well be a police and community member interface. Well, the Inspector General, and this is why I'm speaking to this, because it very well be a remedy, because we would need the authority from the Inspector General, okay? Because what we become, we would become members of the internal affairs. And internal affairs is a very pertinent uh, uh, division in law enforcement. And what they do is they investigate the conduct. So what we would be doing is we would be investigating the conduct of those that claim that they'd be investigating our conduct. Okay, so that's uh, uh, hope, hopefully a panacea that we would like very much for Thank the you, commission to consider. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay, we're now in item number six, the report from the commanding officers, Southeast Area and Operation South Bureau. Good evening. Welcome, gentlemen. I am Bob Green. I'm, uh, as a, when I came in here, I was a deputy chief. Based on your comment, chief, I'm not sure if I'm still there. Uh, still this is my partner. Uh, I have been at South Grove for two years as the deputy chief, and uh, the chief police had the good sense to give me probably one of the finest young commanders in the organization, and Bill Scott is one that props me up at South Bureau, and you'll hear from him in a few minutes. Behind me is Captain Phil Tingarides, who's commanding officer of Southeast Area, and he will have a lot to say about the community safety partnership and things to do with Southeast Area. But before that, a little bit about myself. I started with the LAPD at 15 as a cadet, 
uh, for the department. So in February, I'll have 35 sworn years. So I've been around the department for 40 years. I've watched it as a young adult. I've grown up in the youth programs. And most of my pr policing time has been in and out of South LA. Extraordinarily happy to be here. For those of, the, of you that aren't familiar with the Bureau, 60 square miles with 800,000 folks that we're responsible for, for policing. And some of the most challenging areas in the city based on the poverty in the city of LA. So we're gonna talk about the things that are going really well and things that I think we can improve on. The Chief talked about crime statistics citywide. In South LA, year to date, we have a 3.7% reduction in overall crime. We've got 7.5% reduction in property crime, so we're doing really well in property crime this year. We've got an 8.2 increase in violent crime. However, We've gone 11 years straight in the city, and especially in South Bay, reducing homicides and violent crime. And what I'm gonna talk about in a minute is what I think the reason is we continue to reduce the most significant violent crime we have in South LA. So gang crime is down year to date another 17%. Shots fired incidents, 15.5% or 145 less incidents year to date with people shooting guns. Victims hit 19.6% reduction, 96 less shooting victims year to date in South LA than we had last year. So, I keep talking about those homicide reduction numbers in the city of LA. 15.3% in South LA, 17 less homicide victims today as opposed to last year at the same time. Tremendous work by the community to make that happen. So how does that happen? What's going right in South LA? And I refer to it as relationship-based policing. So I'm gonna talk about some of the stuff that's going really well because the community has come together and embraced us and showed us how to police more effectively and really taught us to look at policing from the perspective of the community. Community Safety Partnership, I'm gonna let Captain Tengarese talk a lot about it. It's an unbelievable program, and if you don't think that a paradigm shift in building partnerships can change a community and change the way they perceive the, poli the police, when he's done, you'll have a, a different opinion. Watch Gang Task Force, a shout out to everybody from Watch Gang Task Force. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Ceasefire, another great organization that's all about gang intervention. Vermont Manchester Collaborative, you know, months ago there was an article that came out in the Times that referred to Murder Alley, an area of the city and the county that came together and had more homicides than any other place in the county, from Florence to Imperial, for the most part, Normandy to Figueroa. And it's because it's right on that border of the city and the county. There wasn't as good a collaboration as there should have been. That has changed today. There's tremendous collaboration with folks like Avis. We're bringing in not only the business perspective for economic development, but open space to get more soccer fields and stuff out there for the kids to keep them out of trouble. So a lot of really good stuff going on in the way of collaboration. Peace rights. Tony Muhammad, Pastor Powell, once a month bringing hundreds, if not thousands of folks together to ride through the most impacted parts of this city to show unity with law enforcement for the, the message of peace. Tremendous work going on by a bunch of folks in this room with the homeless issue, trying to get some of our kids off the street. So, in addition to that, with the change of demographics in South LA, and a lot of folks that don't speak English, for us, ultimately, to continue to re reduce crime and reduce their fear of the police based on where they came from, we've assigned a lieutenant of South Bureau full-time to do nothing but Latino outreach. And some of the things that he's done in the last few months, 147 different ministers and churches he's got on board to give presentations to them about crime and how to prevent crime. In the last two and a half months, they've done a combination of seven peace marches and community cleanups. So they started as a, a community cleanup where they go out and impact an area of the neighborhood. And a lot of folks in this room have been in those marches, and thank you. Now that's getting very much faith-based centered to go to churches and, and get the churches involved in cleaning up around their own neighborhood in conjunction with a peace march to get the, the message out. They've been very, very effective. My vice coordinator every Wednesday night, he's on, on the radio for two hours talking about domestic violence, 
AB 109, the driver's license issues, and gangs. So trying to get that message out on a very broad uh, spectrum for education is critically important for us. Tomorrow, the Crenshaw Christian Center will, will uh, host the National Hispanic Chaplains Association with 3,000 chaplains from across the country coming in to talk about ways we can police better and try and get an education on some of the stuff that we're concerned about. So, Councilman Price talked about the culture change in the LAPD and a great partner. So some of the stuff that we're doing, because we realize we are not there yet. We're, the last five, 10 years, we've gone through tremendous change trying to get better and better and better at what we do. We're trying to reduce use of forces, reduce personnel complaints. And so there's a lot of stuff going on in South LA to get to that means. We started gang interventionists last month and tomorrow is the second class where we'll have gang interventionists teaching our cops about South LA and about what gang intervention is all about. And so now you've got folks that are from the community teaching our cops and trying to give them a community perspective on how we are perceived as policing. It's part of the paradigm shift. We're now talking about in those classes and at some of the, the area orientations, the perspective, historical perspective on policing in Los Angeles starting back in the 1940s when the most significant demographic change of this city came when lots of folks came from the south to be involved in manufacturing along the Alameda Corridor for the war. And what's happened in the decades post that and how we have interacted and the mistakes that we have made so that our cops get a better understanding of why some folks don't like the police and a lot of, why a lot of folks don't trust the police. So that, that push is to help our cops change their par paradigm and better understand this community. Homicide tents. You know, it, it has always bothered me for the last 35 years, we'd come up to a, a homicide scene, we'd have a body on the ground, and I'd have young kids looking out of windows to see that body on the street. And it's, it's horrible. And so in South LA now, every time we have a homicide, we, we respond out there right away and we put a tent up around that body, to protect the crime scene and to pay respect. The feedback from the community has been unbelievably successful because it shows that number one, no kid, should have to look out his or her window to see that body. And it gets our officers to see it from a different perspective. We come out there to protect evidence of the crime scene, but we also have to understand that that victim is somebody's loved one. And what they want to do, that mother wants to get to her baby. So we're trying to change the paradigm on how we police those so it's not such a conflict at crime scenes. The accountability, a couple other things we're doing because, you know, I, I said for a long time, following the chief's lead, is the future for us is not handcuffs. Now at Southeast and 77th, we have a minimal arrest program because I realize that when we put handcuffs on a kid and we give him his first booking number, that will in fact change his life forever and take it on a course that he or she may not be able to recover from. So with that minimal arrest program, you come in with a first arrest or minimal arrest, we can sign you up for a program for six months that involves wraparound services for family and that individual. If after six months that kid finishes that program, he will never get a booking number. That booking number will go away. And instead of keeping that kid in the system for the next two or three decades, we now have given him the opportunity to go in a different direction. South Carolina, we're looking very, uh, very aggressively at restorative justice and trying to partnership with the county to see what we can do with restorative justice across the board so we can change some of the ways we're doing business to give these kids a, a, a better opportunity and a better future. So we talked about accountability. So use of force incidents in South LA are, are down 1.5%, not a lot. But what is, what's really impressive, the chief talked about categorical use of forces where folks get hospitalized. In South LA, they're down 63% this year from where they were last year. We've had four officer golf shootings in South LA. So this, this image everybody has, has of South LA being very violent and, and officers using force constantly, it's not the case. It continues to reduce year after year after year. And we're extraordinarily proud of the work that we put in to the accountability aspect in this bureau to get those kind of numbers. A lot of training with our supervisors on risk management, command and control, and getting them to see things from the eyes of a, a young police officer so they can get out in front of predictable behavior. Work with the mentally ill, that has been um, a very difficult issue for us in South LA especially because a number of times over the years that we've used force and been involved in officer involved shootings have been with those that are mentally ill. Year to date in South LA we've had 1,801 
incidents where we responded to deal with somebody who was mentally ill. Out of those 1,800, 51 times we used force, less than 3%. And that really goes to the restraint and the oversight. In South LA, we require supervisors to respond whenever we have a radio call involving somebody that's mentally ill. Again, it's predictable, so we're trying to get out in front of it to provide leadership for the young police officers that are out there. Okay, so we, we've made tremendous progress. One of the things we have been blessed with, and, and I, I mean blessed with, is cameras in our cars for the last four years. And it has been a significant culture change for our cops. We're not there yet. But in the last four years, the incidents that we've had that have been captured on video have done so much to build public trust, it's unbelievable. When there is, before there's been no evidence, we've had an officer involved shooting, we have a controversy, we have a perspective of what's happened. Now we've got that videotape for waistband shootings and things like that, to where not only I can see it, the commission can see it, the chief of police can see it, and understand the dynamics that went into that incident. And so as we get better, and the beauty of digital in-car video, it tells a story, bad or good. And sometimes it's not good. We're working on that part. But what it does, it provides immediate training and feedback to our cops. Something in law enforcement we have never been able to do. We've never been able to get inside those black and whites and see how those cops are performing once they leave that station, other than when a supervisor may stumble across them. Now, with that videotape, we can go back and look at their performance and identify some at-risk behaviors early on so we can fix those be before they become problematic. And at the end of the day, they do a tremendous service for us for protection the police and the public when it comes to personnel complaints because it will tell that story. So I'm gonna let my partner come up here, um, but number one, for the community, thank you very much for the partnerships. You've embraced us, we appreciate it, we're not there. I, I love the accountability. You're never going to hurt our feelings because you're, you're forcing us to get better. To my cops and all the folks that choose to police South LA, thank you very much because you guys are making a tremendous difference. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Mr. President. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Welcome. Thank you. I'm Commander Bill Scott. As uh, the Chief said, I'm the second in command at Operation South Bureau. So. Just a really, really short thing about myself. You know, I started my career here in, in Southeast Division in 1989, 1990 actually. Uh, been with the department for 25 years, 25 great years, and this is my third tour in South Bureau. So it's definitely a pleasure to, to be of service to the community here. I just wanna real quickly just piggyback on a couple of things that Chief Green spoke of in terms of, of particularly digital in-car video. You know, one of the things that we constantly strive for, and it's one of our core values, is we're always trying to improve. Um, technology has given us the ability to do that. And, it, it, you know, we do make mistakes. We always see areas that we can improve in. But digital in-car video really has given us an opportunity to make this police department one of the best in the world. And I think we are. And we, if, we're, if we're not, we're trying to get there. Um, the ability to, to learn from your actions, to learn from your mistakes, and the accountability piece is something that we're constantly driving to every level of the department, from the chief of police's direction down, is that we're always trying to get better. So what I would ask of you is just work with us. You know, we see things from one perspective, from one lens. You, as, as community members, may see it from another, but together we have a global perspective on what we need to do to get better. And It'll be echoed, and the incidents are going to happen. We see on a national scale uh, things that are happening in the law enforcement world. Uh, we can always get better, and we will we will strive to do that and continue to do that. So I'm going to turn this over to Captain Tingeridis, but thank you for allowing us to be here. And again, um, our, our mission is to serve you. So thank you very much. Good evening, Commissioners, Chief, uh, Mr. Sibley. I uh, really don't get the opportunity to do this that often, but I get to brag tonight about this community. Um, I'd like to start out uh, by, by saying that I have been here at Southeast as an area commanding officer for the last seven and a half years, and I, I need to really thank Chief Beck for that because that has given me the opportunity to really stay on one single course 
to work together, to build partnerships, to get to know who's in the community, and really to build the relationships that has allowed this community to accomplish the things that I'm going to talk about. And so, thank you, Chief. Um, I, let me start by introducing some of my partners on the police department uh, and, and, and who I'm specifically working with. First, uh, Captain Al Passos is the uh, patrol commanding officer at Southeast. Lieutenant John Tippett, up until about two weeks ago, was the, uh, the, the gang lieutenant, uh, and, and I'm going to talk specifically about some of the things that he did that, that changed the culture of the gang unit, that changed the culture of, of officers at Southeast, and, and some of the work that he's done, especially on the west side of, of Southeast. Uh, Lieutenant... Lieutenant Ron Masterson, is he here still? <laughs> Lieutenant Masterson, uh, I think he left, I think he was, uh, his watch was over with. Lieutenant Masterson is the lieutenant in charge of the Community Safety Partnership. I'll talk a little uh, about that in a moment. And just so to make sure I can go home tonight safely, I have to introduce Lieutenant Masterson's partner, um, Sergeant Tingerides, who is also part of the Community Safety Partnership. And her partner in the, in, in the Community Safety Partnership work in, in, in representing HACLA is Joel Lopez. Uh, one of the first things on the agenda was uh, to give statistics for Southeast, and so uh, I want to go through some of that, but, but not necessarily in the, the, the customary way. I want to talk specifically about some of the accomplishments. Uh, this year, we are at a 0.5% crime increase in overall Part 1 crime. Our, uh, our property crimes are down 5.2%, and we are struggling a little bit with our violent crime as they are across the city, primarily in aggravated assaults. But to try and keep it clear on where we're at with violent crime, because when you hear ag assaults, you think violent crime. But this year, Southeast is at 30 homicides. Five of those were from years prior, so it's a little misleading. In 2007, we had the lowest number of homicides uh, the Southeast had had, and that was a total of 36 for the year. At this time in that year, we were at 31. Right now, we're actually at 25. So we are well on our way to have the lowest number of homicides since the station opened in 1978. Number of persons shot. 136 this year. That's too many. But it's also the lowest number since the station opened. In, 2000 and uh, in 2013, last year, it was 183. So we're down very significantly. Almost 50 people less shot this year. In 2007, the lowest homicide year, there was 212 at this time. So what we're doing, working together, especially with intervention, is having a, a tremendous impact. Thank you, Interruption. <laughs> Weapon possession arrests. In, in, you know, these are the arrests that are important to me because every time we make an arrest for somebody carrying a weapon, it's very likely saving a life. In 2007, that low year, we had made 82 possession arrests. Uh, possession, uh, possession of weapon arrests at this point. This year, we're at 220. Wow. 220. And I got to tell you that a lot of that is because we're getting phone calls now. We're getting phone calls. People are trusting us enough to make those phone calls to say, hey, somebody's got a gun over here. And we're getting there and we're making a lot more arrests to save lives. Um, officer involved shootings. So far this year, Southeast has had one. That officer involved shooting occurred back in April on the same day that a young 23-year-old man was walking down the street and was shot uh, multiple times with assault rifles at 10 in the morning at 97th and Main. That shooting caused multiple retaliation shootings between Southeast and 77th between two gangs. And on that day, there was about four or five different people shot. Um, 
once I saw those retaliations going back and forth, I, I emptied the station, got detectives out, I got everybody out that I could to put a presence out there. And one of the units confronted a, a, a man with a gun, and that was our one shooting that day, or that for this year. Our categorical uses of force, we've had 82 this year, non-categorical, I'm sorry, use of force, it's the, 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 the uh, have, we're 82 compared to 93 last year. We're continuing to go down with those. Um, now I'd like to talk a little bit about the Community Safety Partnership. The Community Safety Partnership is a five-year partnership with the Housing Authority, City of Los Angeles. And ultimately we are taking 10 officers and a supervisor and putting them in Nickerson Gardens, 10 in a supervisor in Imperial Courts, and 10 in one in Jordan Downs. <laughs> the whole idea was not to do what we had done for years and years and years, I've always said. Um, the, the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. And so we went in this time with a completely different idea and attitude. But, but you can't just walk in somewhere and say, hey, I got an idea. And so for the last seven and a half years, Southeast, primarily by me and the other captains have been represented every single week for two hours at Watts Gang Task Force. It is... <coughs> the purpose of that meeting was to air differences, air complaints, for relationship building and to build an understanding. So over that time period, um, we, we went at each other, we hurt each other, and we got to a point uh, where five, six years ago, every single week we were talking about some kind of a tragic incident that occurred in, in the neighborhood, about some officer that did something stupid in the neighborhood, and about things that we had to fix. And so we listened, and we, we fixed them. And now, that meeting has turned into talking about trash dumping, um, things that we should be talking about, things that are normal in a, in, a, in a community because the violence is not there like it was before. Because of the relationships that were built, we were able to put those officers into the developments and start focusing on programming, start focusing on changing the quality of life, start focusing on, on taking away the power from the gangs in the area. And gangs had the power because there was no trust. They had the power because they knew that the police treated the community badly, that there was no relationship, there was no communication, and so they weren't worried about anybody calling us and telling us who did what. We had to fix that. That was fixed, it's still being fixed, but we took the power away from the gangs. We started working together with kids. We started programming and bringing in programs that, that we heard that the community wanted. Some of those programs that we have, we started the first uh, Girl Scouts uh, uh, troop at Grape Street Elementary. Um, we're working on uh, putting one at Gompers. Uh, we have Summer Night Lights. We had the Sunburst Youth Academy program. Uh, Chief Green mentioned about alternative to uh, um, putting kids into the justice system. The Sunburst Youth Academy is put on by the National Guard. They have funded us with uh, uh, really an endless number of positions, and we take kids who are 16 and above who are having trouble, they're on the edge, and we've put them in there, and it, it's, it's a program that is a five-month live-in, gives them great uh, uh, high school credits, and when they come out, they're able to graduate from high school, they've worked on their self-discipline, they've worked on their self-esteem, and it changes them into somebody who has focus and goals in life. And I, I can tell you that there's, there's a number of kids that we put in as opposed to arresting them. One in particular I can think of off the top of my head who burglarized a neighbor in Nickerson Gardens. And we were able to get the property back. The neighbor uh, um, was okay with us. Um, we took a crime report. 
that, that young man was put into the uh, Sunburst Youth Academy and graduated and has now gone on into the military. And so there are... That's one example, uh, and, and when you think about the cost savings of taking somebody and putting them into a, uh, a productive position in life as opposed to putting them in the justice system where they'll get better and come back and recidivate and do it again, it is the right way to go. Operation Progress is another part of the CSP. Operation Progress, we now have 55 kids involved in Operation Progress. It is a, a privately funded organization, uh, 501c3, who is taking kids from uh, Watts and putting them into private schools. And as long as they stay within the guidelines of the program, they're guaranteed an education from kindergarten through four years of college. Wow. Our Watts Bears football team is taking young men from the three developments and putting them on a football team together. The whole idea of the Watts Bears program is kids generally 9, 10, and 11 years old. We're working on trying to erase the gang lines. We're working on trying to erase the lines between different communities. We're working on trying to get young men involved in sports to focus on uh, self-discipline, to focus on uh, teamwork, and to have police officers who are coaches who are mentoring them to, to focus on, on, on more positive things in life. Um, HBO Sports, Brian Gumbel is doing a special on this and should be on in the beginning of, uh, of November. And it's, it's an amazing program that has taken parents who live in different developments, bring them together uh, to wearing, wearing bears outfits instead of wearing different colors and cheering for their kids uh, and, and all having a, a, a single focus of working with their kids. And it's been a, just an amazing program. Uh, Starbase uh, STEM Academy is another program that's taking kids, mainly fifth graders. They're going to, uh, again, to the Los Alamitos uh, <coughs> Uh, naval or not naval stations, the Los Alamitos uh, um, military station out in uh, uh, Los Alamitos, and they're going through uh, different programs for for math, science, reading, and it is it has made a big difference in the schools. We've taken about how many kids? About 250 kids from Watts, fifth graders, and put them through that. Um, there, there's a number of other things that are on here uh, as far as some of those programs go, but the main, the main point of this is that we have brought together the community of Watts and we have, have absolutely worked together with Intervention, the Watts Gang Task Force, to build a strong network that when something bad happens, everybody comes together, everybody focuses on trying to stop anything from happening before it does, but when it does start, focus on getting it to stop. Um, it has worked so well that we're now trying to work on the same thing on the west side. And Lieutenant Tippett, when he was the gang supervisor, was going to the Athens on the Hill gang task force. It is kind of the same idea, building the relationships on the west side, working together with intervention on the west side to try and pull together the same kind of partnerships, the same kind of uh, commitment from, from folks who are tired of seeing young men shot. And so those are all, <coughs> those are all the different relationships that have led us to a point where we're now seeing violence drop very dramatically. Thank you. We do have one public comment card on this item. We have Jabral Mohammed. This is Jabril Mohammed for Bismillah, the Justice Movement. Uh, that was a great report on the part of the, uh, the captains and whatnot. However, I've been uh, patronizing the commission now for some year and a half. And in the course of that, <clears throat> there's been issues raised. One of them is the culture that is vamping on our officers. The culture that breaks the cameras in the car so that we do not 
get any surveillance in regards to who's in the car. The culture that kills a person in the car, and yet we cannot determine by virtue of the standard, which is a camera that is supposed to survey the scenario, we do not get the evidence necessary to go forward with whatever discipline is necessary for the sake of the community's safety in regards to the constabulary. Okay, we've had issues where uh, the demographics has been such that out of all the complaints filed, which we didn't receive from South East or, or South Division, how many complaints did we have filed by the community and how were they answered? Well, let me tell you, there was a, 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 a demographic given uh, at the commission during the course of a meeting that stated that out of some 200 and some odd complaints filed, by African Americans who were the, 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 the majority, I think some 64%, and we go on and go on and forth, and then we had Hispanics. They were all unfounded. Okay? They were all unfounded. This is the issues that we need to speak to. And I, and I you know, and I, I've, I've come, uh, how can I say, I've somewhat befriended the commission, so to speak. You know, and so this is not to do anything but create some justice because this is what we're about. Okay, so how do we rectify the culture that my sister Pamela so vehemently stated in some, that it, it's, it's developing on us? How do we rectify that? Thank you, sir. We have another comment card on this item. We have Andre. Welcome. Hey, how y'all doing today? I might need an escort out of here when I get through talking because I don't actually have nothing bad to say. And I'm out of the Watts area, and I've been dealing real tough with Captain Tangerides, Green, helping us do things with the Lowrider Car Club. And if it wasn't for them, it wouldn't be happening right now. Basically what we're doing is like Crenshaw and Watts now. We bring the lowrider cars to relationship building. It's not about the other stuff people say, gang banging and all that right there, because when these brothers see each other through the middle of the week, it ain't where you from. Ain't you the one that I saw over there in Watts and stuff like that? We have Bloods, Crips, Black and Brown. We've been doing it for six months, and we haven't had one fight. But this couldn't have happened without the help of Sergeant Tangerini, Amada, people in the area right there. <laughs> And like I said, when I see it and I hear everybody up here talking, I see the looks on people's face, I'm like, man, do I still want to get up here and speak? But I can't speak nothing but the truth. You know, and that's what I'm dealing with right now. If somebody else has some bad situations, that's what they have. But I'm speaking the truth. No, I'm not paid to get up here. No, I'm not looking for no favors. This is what's actually going on. It's been going on for six months, almost seven months without a problem. But that's what I will speak on on the partnership. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We're now on item number seven, public comment. We have 27 comment cards. We will begin with the first five. Morgan Williams, Willie Hunter, Oscar the Great, Eddie Balto Flores, and Cindy Delgado. <coughs> <coughs> Sure. Okay, let me repeat that. It's Morgan. Welcome, sir. Please step close to the mic so we can we can hear you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. I want to say good evening to the commission. Good evening to the chief. I want to say good evening to the commission, to the chief, Councilman Price. Wow. I feel like I'm a linguistic, uh, linguistic uh, midget here in the wake of what's been said. But I just want to say this. I spoke with the chief when I first came in, and I just wanted to let him know that I support him being the chief of the second largest law enforcement agency in the nation. It's a tough job. And unfortunately, members of the community don't necessarily understand what it takes to run an organization of such magnitude. And the disconnect being members of government get paid to be members of government. Members of the community don't get paid to be, be members of the community. So members of the community is not as organized as members of government. So we have to look at that paradigm. Um, what I'm here to say is we want the support of law enforcement, LAPD, Sheriff's Department, because on November the 1st, we're hosting an event called the Friendship Games. Now, this event is an effort to bring law enforcement and members of the community together in a sporting event at St. Andrews Park because tensions are high in the community from young so-called African-American males 
asking the question of the individuals that are there to protect and serve them, they're asking who's going to protect us from the individuals that are supposed to protect us. And so what we determined is that the, one of the ways to ease the tensions is to bring police officers and members of the community together in a sports competition. It's going to be boxing, basketball, tug of war, and track. There's an old Chinese proverb that says you don't know a man until you've eaten with the man. So we're trying to create an environment where law enforcement can come without their badges, without their guns, and members of the community can come and see law enforcement and engage in competition, right, without being necessarily police, so that police officers you, sir. and members of the community get a chance to see each other on a different path. We're, pa we're passing the card around. Okay, please state your name. Welcome. You Hi, my name is Morgan Williams. I'm with YJC Youth Justice Coalition. And I'm going to um, speak on, I didn't hear nobody talk about this, but LA say that, says that they don't have a stop and frisk policy. Um, I feel they do. Um, a lot of minority black and brown are being stopped, pulled, told to sit on the ground just because of what they might be have, what they might wear, or you know, just because we have eth uh, ethnic look to us. And I feel like that's a form of racism. That's a form of um, racial profiling, and it's and it's not right. Um, I feel real strongly on this, me personally, because I'm from New York and I. have I know in New York they have um, a stop and frisk policy, and there's no difference from the, you know what and LAPD is doing and what NYPD is doing. So I feel like it's the same thing, and I feel like this is something that they need to stop doing because it's not right. It's based, it's not giving. I, I feel like basically you you're not giving me a, you're not giving the youth or you know the minority a chance to really make it in life because you're just profiling them or just on the way they look or the way they may dress. So that was just thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, can y'all hear me? I'm kind of short, going back. <laughs> Hi, my name is Cindy, and I'm with the Youth Justice Coalition, and I would like to share my experience with the law enforcement. Um, last year, on June 3rd, I was on my way home, and I fell asleep on the wheel with my daughter on the back seat. Um, I hit another vehicle. My car caught on fire, and as I tried to get out the car to get my daughter out, um, Two officers from Holland Bag tackled me down as I was screaming for help um, for my daughter. They, they were still um, forcing me, putting my head on the ground and just jumping on me. And then they want to do a lawsuit saying that I put my hands on them when I was really trying to save my daughter. So we both went into custody. I went into Lingua, and my daughter went into foster care straight to Palmdale's. And I did not know where my daughter was at for a whole month. And within those 48 hours that my daughter was taken away from me, she was supposed to be in place with a family member, but an officer broke my phone where I couldn't call a family, so that's why they sent her to Palmdale's. And when she was in Palmdale's, uh, my daughter was taken illegally out of California without my consent or my acknowledge when I did not lose my parenting rights. And... Um, they help with the Youth Justice Coalition, L.A. Can and RAC. Um, they dropped my charges from um, child endangerment. Um, I mean, my time, they was trying to give me almost two years for falling asleep on the wheel with my daughter when my daughter had seatbelt on, and the officer said she did not have no seatbelt, and I know she did. Until this day, I still have no police report. And... Um, I think it's really unfair, and I think that you guys should stop separating families, especially mothers, from their children. And um, this is why I support the 1% campaign, to support other women like me. Thank you. Who still want to get the education. Thank you. Welcome. 
Hello, good night. Uh, my name is Adil Roberto Francisco Flores. I'm with the Judas Coalition. Um, I want to speak on um, behalf with um, Schoolies Police being in the school campus. Um, matter of fact, I actually went to the school right here called Star Region Number 12. I was in the Academy TAD as well. Towards when I was in there, I was, you know, usually profiled a lot by the school police as well. I was blamed for a tagging that I did not did as well. And so towards where they went ahead and they suspended me and towards where they went ahead and they threatened me as well, saying that if I did not remove myself from the campus, they will go ahead and take forces on me. And so towards my mom even went towards down the school and said, where's the proof? Police officer even came and said that there was a staff. They seen me, but no staff came and never ever said the proof or anything. They have no proofs against me. Nothing recorded me, no picture or anything. So towards where if there was a peace builder, like we have at the Free LA High, at the UJ Coalition, the school that I'm attending right now, and I'm about to graduate in November as well. Towards where they have peace builders right there, and as well, they understand you. They understand and they live in the community as well. They understand the struggles that everybody goes through right here. You know, towards, you know, even if you're, you're, even if you're a former gang member or you're just going ahead and you're doing handling your business, going to school and just trying to go ahead and change. Towards where they understand you. Towards where, you know, they've been through the same struggles where you have been. Towards they leave you. You know, they have lived in the same neighborhood that you lived in. They're still living in the neighborhoods where any of these police officers right here don't live in any of my neighborhoods. Don't live in no, nobody else's neighborhood right here. They don't live out here in South LA. They don't live in Watts. You know, we need peace builders that will understand us. They will, you know, go ahead and understand and sit us down and tell us, I know what you're going through. I've been in that situation where none of these police officers have been in those situations. So might have, but not all have, you know. As well, that's why I'm supporting the 1% campaign in Prop 47. They will go ahead and will go ahead and, and have minor friendlies to go ahead to be dropped to misdemeanors. That's what I'm supporting. I'm from the UJUST Coalition. Thank you very much. Good evening which is God at the head of my life, to all the board members, police officers, council members, whoever will be my have present tonight. First go out to Commander Green, he had a very fine officer here. I have known him for several years. Uh, I've asked God to put an arm of protection around everybody that wear the badge because you got one of the, as I know, dealing with the general public, you got one of the worst jobs that possibly could have. But my concern today is uh, drugs selling in these alleys, make to be homeless people behind churches and stuff. We need to put a stop to that. Uh, and so I've lived in District 9 for over like 30 years, and I see a, a great decline in services. First, like people, vendors on the street, when school let out, we got to clear up our sidewalks. I thought we were against the law to block sidewalk or public sidewalks. Well, you got vendors that's taking over in our community and nothing being done about it, you know? And the water situation with the water usage. This, they told me I could talk about whatever I want to talk about. I constantly observe and report nightly that the city is constantly wasting water in these parks. Uh, the resident is getting free car washes. The water is running down the drain. I observe this nightly where I can't water my grass, but you can waste water, you know? And an, a, another issue is the street cleaning issue, issue in District 9. I barely, rarely get my street swept on a timely basis, and it's a constant situation. Like I said, I live in the neighborhood for over 30 years. I should know what I'm talking about if I live there and I constantly see trash on my street, and I had to get out in front of my own house and do the job. That switch uh, the trash pick up. Thank you very much for your time. May God bless you all. The next five speakers are Lou Hollingsworth, Davon Williams, Brandy Braun, Ralphika Garnett, and Nancy Flores. And please state your name before you speak. Thank you. My name is Brandy Brown, and I'm with the Youth Justice Coalition. Um, I'm a friend of Ezell Ford. Um, what I'm here today is for basically make it clear to the community that the officers is involved in any shootings resulting into any deaths or any deaths are removed from the field 
field duty and pending the investigation. Why I'm here today is because I want to know what happened to the cops that killed my friend. And I want to know what actions are being took against that. What can I tell his mom that still cries about her son that's being killed by LAPD just on October the 14th was his birthday. And he's not even here to celebrate any kind of day or anything. So I'm here today for justice for him and justice for anyone else that has lost their life due to LAPD. And here with the Youth Justice Coalition, we have a petition signed to get a state attorney general to appoint, to appoint a special prosecutor to, pol to prosecute the police and the killings that's going on because it's not right for them to take our lives or anything. I have a one-year-old daughter and my daughter, when she see the police, she say, hands up, don't shoot. I am here to save our kids and to save our our future. So please, I urge anyone who want to sign this petition, please come see me, see anyone with their face painted. We had this petition. Please sign it. I urge everyone out here tonight to please sign it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rafika Garnett. I'm a youth organizer with the Youth Justice Coalition. I'm here tonight to speak on the behalf of the police killings. And basically, I just wanted to talk about, um, to make it clear to the community that the police or the police that are involved in the deaths, they're only getting reassigned and they're not, you guys actually aren't given the full investigation on the murders. And as far as I mean, me being a community member, um, I've been attending marches and you guys are speaking on how Watts has been saved. I actually live in Watts and just last week I just killed um, Johnny Martinez and it was an uh, unallegated murder. Like I ran up in his house and his dad was telling you guys don't shoot him and y'all still shot him. And I just marched with that to the Linwood County Jail. Like, you guys are not just giving the community no explanation as to nothing. You guys are just treat. You guys have true, happy police officers out here killing the community. Not just the game makers, okay? The game makers are one thing, but they're not even doing nothing. Like you said, the game makers haven't even did any crimes lately or no, like, no shootings like that. So basically, you guys are saying that it's low. That's a lot. We have petitions and um, papers that are going passed around showing, like, 251 murders, I think, that you guys have done within the last two or three months, and they're all unsolved. Nobody's saying anything, and I'm just here to support, and I'm going to keep supporting everybody who's being killed by the police, and I just ask that you guys take all the police off of the force, like, or um, at least prosecute them with murder, just like everybody else, because everybody's him, man. And I'm not going to have my kids walking around being fearful for that my kids going to be shot when they get older. And they're not going to have no explanation on the police. not about to be able to have no money for the family uh, funeral and having us out on the corners doing car washes and raising that money. And y'all doing it. Hi, my name is Nancy Flores. I'm with the Youth Justice Coalition. And I'm here to speak on the police presence in my school. Um... Walking to school, I feel really overwhelmed with the police presence. Um, just the, I, we don't feel safe with police, pre, armed police officers in our schools, in our learning environments. Just the other, just a couple days ago, I saw an African American boy being hauled into the office with his hand behind his back, cuffed. <laughs> he was being hauled by officers, and I heard an officer just say today that that will influ that will have a great influence on a person's life. And it made me really, made me really think about that boy. So, <laughs> so I am really, in, I'm really a strong supporter of bringing peace builders, people that we know, people that can relate to our situations and our community, into our schools. And we deserve better. We deserve to feel safe in our learning environments and to have a proper education. And that's all I got to say. Hello, my name is Davon. I'm also from the Youth Justice Coalition, and what I would like to speak about is having community oversight. Now, as you see, um, my um, people right here have spoke about all the violence that is going on coming up from law enforcement, the Ezell Ford case, not even just happening in L.A., but all over the nation with the Michael Brown thing and everything. But my point is, is to have civilian oversight that is actually effective where we have some real authority in what is going on so that these these police or whoever law enforcement can actually be prosecuted it shouldn't take this long to do so and it's it's just getting very disturbing and just frustrating really frustrating really no 
Um, so we would like some civilian oversight, especially from people from this community who, and at least for some to be some youth and people who have been involved in the system. Thank you. The next five speakers are Jabral Mohammed, Andrea Vargas, Juan Pena, Michelle, and Kim McGill. Commissioners, the Jabril Mohammed pissed me a lot of justice movement. You know, the, the, uh, the whole idea of the phone drawn wrong phone is something that I've been participating in, even though I have not included. And I, oh, vote. Who's in favor of, of what we just spoke of in terms of the community's involvement in policing, policing? Are we gonna see that? Yeah? Oh, okay, I'm just trying to just get a demographic. But the point here is, that, is this, and that is that my youngsters, you know, me being Roman and whatnot, here I am coming down the street, right? So I see one of my youngsters get out the car. So when he get out the car, I say, and where's your, uh, uh, you, I see you got your uh, 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 body cam? Ah, where's your body cam? Huh. When I do get it, I'm going to break it. <coughs> now, this is just a report. Okay, so now I'm, I'm saying that, now he might have meant that, he might not have meant that. But the point has been is that we had, when I asked him that, we have had evidence that they're doing that. Okay, so we want some surveillance. We need some surveillance, we need some transparency, that's all. And I believe that once we get that transparency, that a lot of things will be settled and, and, and the transparency could very well come in the guise of the people being involved to the point where they can see the records. Okay, we're hoping that that be the case at some point. Okay, and then we can administrate our welfare. And this is, this is important. This is not just some witch hunt. We, our welfare is at stake. Our lives are at stake. Our youth are at stake. Our dignity are at stake. Our morals are at stake. All these things are at stake if we do not guard our conduct. Okay, and if we let things run them up, and we are here for the sake of police brutality, so this is what we're speaking on, and I don't, it's, it's, you know, it's not a popularity contest, okay? So let's do what's right. Let's empower the people. Hello, my name is Andrea Vargas. I'm with the Youth Justice Coalition, and I would like to share a small story with you guys. Um, when I was nine years old, I was removed from uh, the custody of my mother for child abuse and child neglect. Um, on my way home from school, when I uh, got home, uh, I was uh, me, my twin brother, and my big sister were uh, handcuffed and put in the back of a police car until social services arrived, and I was taken to command post for three days. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, as I tried my heart, uh, my best to uh, forget about that day, so it's kind of hard to speak about it. Um, that day, not only did I lose my family, but I lost my childhood. Um, since January 2007, 316 people were killed by uh, law enforcement. 313 were shot, two were killed by tasers, and one was uh, beaten to death. By sharing this story with you guys, I, I really hope to inspire you guys and to put our recommendation on the Police Commission and maybe one day have a one-to-one -one heart uh, conversation about how the, treat, the youth are being treated here, not only the youth, but anybody else in the community. We are human. You're dehumanizing us, you know? It's, man, I'm a child, not a criminal. Okay, man, I'm, I can't even, I can't even speak nothing about it, man. I got, thank you. Hello, my name is Juan Peña, and I'm an organizer with the Youth Justice Coalition. Um, the Day of the Dead is coming up, November 1st, November 2nd. Um, family members and friends gather and pray for their loved ones that have been, that have passed away. That's how our faces are painted, to honor those people who have died. And in four years, YGC has lost 53 young people who have been killed due to police and street violence. No one wants the shootings to stop more than we do. If we match at least 1% one, 1 of funds used to lock up youth, street violence will be lower than it already is. With that, with that percent, with that 1%, it could, for, it could fund 500 intervention workers, 50 youth centers, and 25,000 youth jobs. 
also established the LA County Office for, for Youth Development. And I also had a question. The violence is already is down like they were stating earlier. Why are police getting more and more militarized weapons? My name is Michelle Watson, and I'm from Youth Justice Coalition also. Um, and I am here to say, demilitarize the police in the 1033 program. <coughs> In the pipeline of military surplus weapons, Humvees, and assault weapons, including ending the sharing of military funds, training procedures, and tactics being used with lethal force in our communities in the 1033 program because more guns in our communities do not make people feel safe. Youth crime is at its lowest since the 1950s, and Chief Green already said that there has been an overall reduction in crime in the community. But with the recent report that the Youth Justice Coalition has released called Shoot to Kill, we have found that there has been an increase in officer-involved shooting in L.A. County. So one of my solutions to this problem is to defund LAPD budget and reinvest those funds into building our community and supporting our youth. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Kim McGill, and I really appreciate that the police commission came out tonight to the community where we live. We usually go to you guys, and it's um, really an honor to have you here, and we hope that more and more of this happens. Um, I'd also encourage for the issues that the community is bringing up to be put on the agenda so we can have a real conversation where you can respond instead of during public comment where there's no conversation. And I urge that all the solutions you've heard tonight from all the people that are here, um, that they really lead to that kind of an agenda item so we can have a real conversation. Um, Tanisha is going to give out a report on the police shootings that we have LA countywide. We don't yet have, we have to get it through a public record ask request, which divisions were responsible for which shootings. But we do have from 2007 to 2014 every single shooting by address. So you can see that a lot of them are within LAPD jurisdiction. We don't want to assume that it was only LAPD officers that were involved in the shooting. Um, yet, despite that, there hasn't been, a, to our knowledge, a single one of those shootings that has resulted in any um, uh, prosecution by the district attorney's office. And that's why we're also going to the state attorney general's office to ask for their assistance in prosecution and investigation. Um, lastly, I think there's some really uh, disturbing trends in the data as we looked at it. 20 of the people that were killed were mentally ill, autistic, or deaf. Um, at least 19 of the people that were killed were running away. Numerous people, over 20 I think it was, were killed when they did not have lethal force. Of course, there were many people, and we're trying to get that data also from the coroner's office, who were unarmed. Armed. But of the people that were armed, the majority were armed with things like tree branches. I say armed in quotes, with tree branches or with poles, and in many cases even knives. And we're wondering if there couldn't be a different kind of force used or a different kind of training used when people are armed with knives, as was happened oftentimes with mentally ill people. In seven of the cases where police were called to save a person's life because the person was suicidal, police shot the person that was attempting suicide. Um, so we think obviously with mental illness, um, not only does there need to be more training, but more importantly, the PET team needs to be first on the scene and other mental health workers first on the scene before law enforcement intervenes, especially when the family members are right there begging Thank the you. police to hold off on their intervention. Thank you. Here the next five speakers are Dwayne Smith, Sunja Kim, Aaron Schwartz, Bart, Andre, and Emma Cortez. How you doing? I'm, it's Dewan Smith. I'm a community organizer for YJC, a youth advocate. Uh, we hear that crime is down in the community and, uh, you know, the community is speaking up, you know, stepping up, changing the culture of the inner city. Uh, I even heard the lowest number of uh, shootings since the station's been open tonight. Um, I thank you for that. You know, violence has dropped dramatically. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the generation who did it. Our generation. Um, we decided to speak up and step out and change. So, uh, uh, why haven't you got rid of the military equipment? I hear that, you know, it's for the safety of our officers. I hear a lot of what if scenarios, like, you know, what if this happens, or, you know, uh, but that creates division between you guys and the community. Um, 
Uh, we're working, we're working on it. That's that's what I heard tonight a lot. We're working on it. Work with us. Uh, I know they say that policing is a thankless job. You know, I thank you tonight for your efforts, uh, but I think that uh, if you get rid of the military weapons, that'll be a, a big step uh, in showing the community that you are working with us. Thank you. I'm Aaron Schwartzbart, uh, driver of Motor Gospel Ministries John 316 race car, and I have a very different experience with the LAPD. Uh, I was big trouble in the community until I went through a very dramatic religious conversion about 20 years ago. I should have been locked up. I should have been shot. Uh, I had it coming. Uh, I went through a very big change. Uh, my life is very, very different today, and I'm here to commend the excellent, excellent community policing of uh, Captain Todd Chamberlain and his team at Mission Station uh, in Mission Hills. Uh, he and all of his slows and crows and everybody else I've interacted with there uh, have exhibited a tremendous balance amongst professionalism, warmth, and importantly, common sense. Uh, they've kept the politics and the bureaucracy to a minimum in working cooperatively with our organization, Motor Gospel Ministries, toward our common goal of seeing young people make it to adulthood without killing themselves or anybody else. And yes, I don't deny anything that y'all are experiencing here as far as uh, allegations of police brutality, but there's also no denying that young people are dying at the hands of other young people, of gang members. There are places where there's unrighteous peace in the community where there's peace only as long as the honest folks in the community hide inside their apartments with their blinds drawn because they're afraid to go out in public because they might get shot by somebody who isn't old enough to shave yet. Um, uh, the, the excellent example of community policing that uh, we're seeing at Mission Station uh, may be uh, a reflection of uh, this board of commissioners, so y'all are to be commended as well for providing the service to the community to whatever extent uh, Todd Chamberlain and company's excellent performance is, is reflected of this board. Our next event is the Motor Gospel Peace March, Saturday, November 1st, in the Safer Cities Initiative Zone in North Hills. We'll have 60 to 80 hardened convicts that have gone straight, that are walking shoulder to shoulder with the PD, going through the hood to call for peace. Thank you, and keep up the great work. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sunim Kim. I'm the president of the World Special Federation. As a nonprofit organization, we are proud to offer special programs to people with physical disabilities. Our organization's motto is the title, We Are One. WSF's agenda is to encourage participants to develop a sense of empowerment so that they may take control of their own health and well-being. Our objective is to bring hope and inspiration to the lives of each of those we encounter. And just to give you a few examples how we do this. We assist people with a disability with low impact to strengthen the mind and the body. We coordinate monthly street cleanups with community members. We conduct free taekwondo classes in elementary schools in Watts and South LA. We provide free jackets and gloves to homeless members of our community. We give free acupuncture treatment to all police officers. All our program for community always with always partnership with the LAPD. With, with our Southeast Division help, this would not be possible. So I say thank you again, Southeast Division. Thank you, Captain Tangreed. Mm -hmm. Thanks. How y'all doing? I'm up here once again. I figured it was going to be something I forgot I wanted to talk about. So I'm going to reintroduce myself. <laughs> okay, my name is Andre. I'm a consultant for the AP, gang intervention specialist. My training came through Cal State LA with Pat Brown Institute, then after then the LaVita, you know, training. 
And I say that to say we need to be educated on how to deal with the officers and things like that because I was the same way. And don't think I'm not sentimental towards the people that have been killed through the officers. I don't condone no wrongdoing that go for the street side or the law side. But we have to be educated on how to deal with them and stuff like that. You get, you get more with sugar than you do with salt. So as I start talking to some of the officers, some of the officers don't even really know no better. I don't know if they got it in the roll call or where they got it at. When you start talking to them, you see their mentality like they really didn't know. They didn't have a clue. But we so standoffish with them and don't want to talk to them, disrespecting them in all kind of ways at the end of the day. Like I tell the people in my community, they humans too. It ain't no fun when a rabbit got the gun. So I use frown in your face and doing all this stuff. Now he got you. And I'm not saying it's right because they should have more training than that to just jump to conclusions. But you got to think. I mean, it's just a reality. They're human beings at the end of the day. I mean, like I say, some of the stuff that Captain T do, like when the new officers come in the end, roll call. He brings us up there to roll call so they can know who's doing intervention in the community. So now we have a relationship where we can talk. And I'm, when I say talking anything or telling, our thing is gang intervention is to prevent the next one from happening, not telling who did what or whatever. Our job is to prevent the next one from happening. You have enough people out there doing that part right there. But like I say, I want to thank the whole CSP team and maybe different people in different communities should think about getting CSP over in their area and then you will see a wise man changes often, a fool never changes. And I thank y'all once again. Mi nombre es Emma Cortés y vengo de los proyectos de Jordan 2. Estoy hablando en, de parte de todos los que vivimos ahí. Good evening, my name is Emma Cortés. I come from the Jordan Downs housing projects and I'm speaking on behalf of my community there. Porque ya no aguantamos este, que la policía cada rato pasa dando tickets a los carros aunque estén registrados en housing. Because we can't we can't take it anymore that the police is being that the police is coming to our community just ticketing cars that are even even when they're registered with the housing authority sticker. Y le venimos a, vengo a pedir a nombre de todos los que vivemos ahí que por favor nos ayude porque quebradera de vidrios, este robo de baterías, pues entonces en lugar de comprar marqueta vamos a tener que comprar batería, los hijos están en la universidad. So um, I'm here to ask for your help because what's going on right now in Jordan Downs um, is that there have been a lot of robins in our cars now parking them further, um, stealing our batteries, and now instead of being able to, fi to buy our basic um, food necessities, we're having to purchase batteries and pay tickets. A mi hija el domingo a las ocho, un moreno le puso la pistola en la sien, le robó su, su teléfono, y le tiró un balazo. Entonces, la policía, ¿qué está haciendo? Nosotros queremos que nos ayude a protegernos, no a estar dando tickets. So, this, um, uh, this just this weekend at 8 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, I believe she said, an African-American member of the community had put a gun to my daughter's head and then shot in the street. Um, and we called the police. They never showed up. So, what are they doing when these kinds of things happen? What are they there for, just to give us tickets? Y hay más personas que las han robado y nos tenemos que parquear en otro lado y pues en este tiempo para nosotros es peligroso porque es Navidad. Así se pone. So now we have to park our cars, our vehicles very far away and it's going to be a dangerous time because it's Christmas time. So this is, this is, um, this is the dangers that we're facing. Thank you. Mi hija está Thank you. en la universidad y pues tiene que venir a las nueve y aquí viene llegando a las once. Okay. Thank you. Solamente tiene que tener su carro. So my daughter's in university and she she leaves there at nine o'clock, gets home at eleven o'clock. She needs to be able to park somewhere near me. Okay. Thank you very much. Gracias. Okay. The next five speakers: Montserrat Mancheco, Lucelia Hooper, Tanisha Denard, Gerald Thompson, Minnie Hadley Hempstead. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Montserrat Pacheco y vengo de los apartamentos de Jordan Down. Good evening, my name is Montserrat Pacheco and I come from the Jordan Downs Apartments. Ay, vengo porque necesitamos más este, protección de la policía porque hay mucha violencia y luego a, a mí hace dos semanas me asaltó un moreno y ya no hay ni cómo salir a la marqueta porque ahí hay mucha violencia. There's a lot of violence in my community. We're here asking for more um, support from the community. I was assaulted just recently coming back from the market. 
También mi hija llega de la escuela después de las nueve y luego también tiene uno que parquearse al lado de la, no, del lado de la calle 97 y también ahí es muy peligroso porque pasa mucha gente como que si fuera la carretera de carreras y no hay policías tampoco y ni del otro lado de la 99. My daughter also comes home from school very late, like at 9 o'clock at night. She has to now park very far away from home over by 97th Street. This is a big problem area because cars drive at all speeds there very fast and there is no police um, security there either. Cuando se llega también a hablar a la policía, necesitan tener uno traducción y cuando uno como hispano no habla uno el inglés, nos cuelgan y no nos quieren tomar la llamada. When we call the police for support as a, as a Hispanic um, who doesn't speak English, um, we get hung up on, they won't accept our call, they won't listen to our concerns. Mm -hmm. This is, Thank you. That's all. Gracias. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Commissioner Lucilia Hooper with the City of Los Angeles Housing Authority. And I would just like to say that I'm grateful to be here this evening to speak about the seniors in Nickerson Gardens. There was a time that the seniors could not walk out in the evenings, but now, since we have a community partnership with the police, they are able to walk around and do the exercise. And Chief Beck, I would like to thank you for giving us the officers that we have to work in our communities. And Captain T, thank you. We went through six officers, six captains before we got him. And when we first met him, we was at uh, From the Heart. He had a program where the residents could come in and sit down and talk to him about their community. And I would just like to say, I'm a part of the Watts Gang Task Force. I'm the vice president. And on behalf of Betty Day, we are very happy to have a partnership with LAPD and the other officers that work in uh, Nicholson Gardens, Jordan Downs, and Imperial Courts. And I'm just happy to be here. I feel like crying for what I'm hearing, but no one is talking about the seniors, and those are the people that we should really be concerned about, for them to go outside and be able to go outside of their homes without people robbing them and all of that. So I would just like to say thank you for this meeting this evening. Good afternoon, my name is Tanisha Denard, and I'm also with the Youth Justice Coalition. Um, I'm here in the name of Ezel Ford, Mike Brown, and um, Johnny Martinez, who were killed by the law enforcement, along with the rest of the 591 people that were killed in L.A. County by law enforcement since 2000. Um, since 2007 through 2014, there were 316 people that were killed by law enforcement. 97% of them were male, 82% were black and Latino, and 52% were under 30. So while we talk about reductions, we also need to talk about solutions. As Cindy and Navon had explained earlier, the 1% campaign is a perfect example where people can have something to do when they have a youth center to go to after they get out of school that's not shut down when school hours are over because um, our school programs that we have are for students that only attend those schools. So what about the other students that want to make groups and do arts and crafts after school? We're kicked out of those schools. So we need a place where we can stay after school and be there on the streets after so um, young people aren't looked at as gang members and all this kind of stuff. So when you see us at nighttime on the street, you should be your first thoughts should be, oh, they're coming from this youth center or that youth center, or they're coming from this class or that class. Now, what are they doing out in the middle of the night and just criminalizing people? Because that's how we look at right now. Until we um, build a better future for our youth, you guys are still going to look at this the same way. But we really need solutions put in place, so I would urge you guys to also look into the 1%, and we would love to have a, a, a meeting with the Inspector General's office to talk about some of these things, and also have the statistics and the report um, to give you guys. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Minnie Hadley Hempstead, and I'm the president of the Los Angeles branch of the NAACP. It is my pleasure to be here this evening to see all of the commissioners, I've never met all of you before, the chief and all of the officers. We had an affair on Saturday in the community, and we had such a high 
police presence, and we had such an enjoyable day, and I'd like to see it continue always. Uh, I think we are one community. We should not be adversaries. We should work together. Some of the things officers have done, I've talked to you about them. Uh, we want to be treated like we treat you. We respect you, we pay you well, we dress you well, and I've been in countries that had old raggedy police cars. Our officers are sharp, and we only want the ones on the street who respect us. If you have a problem respecting us, we might be dirty, we might not smell so nice. If you have a problem with that, you have the wrong job. We want, we want our officers to respect us. It does not matter how we look, how we smell, or whatever. I have one complaint tonight. Uh, I was very concerned when Ezel Ford was killed on 65th and Broadway. But when I went up there, I saw a wasteland of our young men with no jobs, no present, no future. And I've asked one of the chiefs, if you have programs so you can help our young people, because that's what we need. And when Ezel was shot down on the street, I went into the community to talk with the members of the community. They said he did not talk to anyone. He did not bother anyone. Thank you. He only laughed and talked with himself. Thank you. He was sh Oh, is my time up? Let me say one more thing. Sure. Uh, when he was killed and they performed the autopsy, we said, what happened? They said, it's not complete. They never are. But at least we wanted a preliminary to give us something. Thank you. Thank you. Gerald Thompson, uh, co-founder of Pathways to the Future Transition Age Youth Program. I'm also the founder of the formerly gang intervention program called the Frontline Soldiers. And most recently, two years ago, I co-founded the South Los Angeles Homeless Transition Age Youth and Foster Care Collaborative. And I want to say thank you guys for being here. Mr. President and Chief, Commissioners, I'm glad to see the diversity here. And I want to take my hat off to the young people, and I need to give you some history. When I was your age, this would not be going on. This is a whole different ball game of the community and law enforcement. And I take my hat off to the leadership of you guys letting us get together like we need to to try to save our people. Uh, I wanted to just mention one thing. I'm, I'm usually not politically correct. But uh, right now, I want to talk about something real quick. It's that a lot of law enforcement uh, problems in our communities, especially in our poor communities, are because they're dealing with homeless people, whether they be mentally ill or not. A lot of our gang members, sex trafficking, and all that are being easily done because the young people that are involved are homeless. And Chief Green put on a great event, LAPD, a couple of months ago that allowed us to introduce law enforcement to the homeless population. And I believe that should open up the eyes to law enforcement or we need to look at homeless people a little different because they are not all there for the same reason. All of them are not drug addicts, all of them are not gang members, and all of them are not mentally ill. But I bet you every last one of them suffer from post-traumatic stress. And we need to make sure that we address this population of young people and adults a different manner so they because they are not criminals because they're homeless. They're only criminals if they break the law. Thank you for that. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Joe Thompson, and uh, I'm a local business owner here in this community. And I've been a product of this community. I've graduated from elementary, junior high school, and high school within this community. And I live here by choice. Excuse me. So the um, reason why I'm here today is because uh, I don't think that there's a good working relationship with the local law enforcement and the local business owners. 
I think that law enforcement officers should be in touch with who the business owners are in this community and have been in this community for quite some while. So uh, just recently, my barbershop was raided. And in the process of the raid, after everyone was pulled outside, I asked the leading officer, may I ask a question? He says, yes. And uh, his name is Detective Eric Shears. So he asked me, I asked him, may I see the search warrant? He went from zero to 100. Everybody's not ignorant of the law. And everybody that's a young black man is not a felon. I run a legit business. And that particular day, it affected me, just like it affects young people. Whatever happens to people emotionally, money can't replace that. And most of the time, people go after lawsuits and things like that, and the officers still remain in the community. I have a voice. I was told not to speak, but I am going to speak. And the reason why I spoke is because of who raised me and the reason why I'm still here today. I've been a victim of a violent crime. My father was killed right across the street where I live, but I'm still in this community, and I need the police to respect the business owners coming in, doing unlawful searches, and not denying me the search warrant three times, I found a problem with that. You drive up and down Maine all the time, but you don't know a barbershop exists there. You don't even support the barbershop. But my money goes towards paying taxes in various forms. That's where money goes in the community. So I'm just wanting to use my voice and let people know I'm here in the community to do some good. I'm not here to do any bad, and I run a legitimate business, and where is the accountability from the officers? You ask questions, I tell you the truth. The truth don't matter, because you think I'm hiding something. So this is why I'm here today. I was an LAPD explorer. You were at my graduation, Charlie Beck. I have a picture with you. Okay, thank you, sir. The next five speakers, Dr. Perry Crouch, Valmy Perez, Reverend J James J.J. Jones, Clarence Allen. <laughs> my friend. How you doing, Mr. Subaraw? Go a long ways back, brother. Vice President, Ms. Matson, Chief Beck. We've been friends since before you even thought about being chief. I, I, I'm here wearing a different hat because I was on that side with, um, with the young people when we were right there. Uh, I stopped teaching school and got thrown in the gang intervention 30 years ago to bring us to where we are today. Beyond the blue is human beings. Beyond the blue is Christians. Beyond the blue is taxpayers and family people. Are they good? Yes. Are they bad? Yes. But let's, let's move fast forward. Are we making progress? Under Chief Beck leadership, Assistant Chief Paysinger, Deputy Chief Green, Commander Scott, our beloved captain, and his team, I'm one of the ones that fought for the CSPs. Is it working? Yes. It is working. Would it, would it have worked with us not coming together? No. So my, mes my message to my young brothers and sisters, you have to establish a relationship. It's not you against them, uh, us against them. It's, 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 about, it's about bridging that gap. And if y'all need some help in setting up meetings, with the, I'll, be, I'll, I'll put mine on the line. I'm a frontline soldier. I lead marches and on, I'll do it. So I mean, I just want, us to look at them as human beings and not always look at them in a confrontational manner. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Thank you all for coming out to the Chief, to Commission Board. My name is Clarence Allen. I'm a concerned citizen, also a supporter of ceasefire. And the reason I came here is because of the big umbrella we live under is violence. This big umbrella that we live up on is, is the habitats of slavery. We're all people down here on this earth. You know, uh, I consider many of you police I have a personal relationship with as my friend. You all are human, and we as civilians are human. I'm an honorable, honorable uh, discharged naval veteran, but right now a civilian, after my uh, discharge, I have to go through the same things me and my brothers 
that go through with racial profiling in this country. We have the best police department in this nation. Chief Beck, you come a long way. I've talked to you before at the King March. You come a long way in bridging that, that, that gap, bringing it closer between law enforcement and us, the people of this community. But right now, Chief, we got to do a different amount of training with law enforcement. Law enforcement come from a group of overseers which hunted slaves and captured them. That's why we have shootings of blacks in this country. We just have some people that, from our personal growth, our spiritual growth, and our social growth, in between all those judgments on those calls in these streets. Why are we hunt down? Why are we hunt down, huh? Why are we the victims? It's time for us to break this evil spell which we are under the Willie Lynch and the modern Jim Crow mass incarceration during this color blindness. But it's time to regulate. What I've written here can break this spell. All it simply does is break us down to just simply human beings. You respect me? I respect you. Thank you for your time. Good evening, commissioners. Um, my name is Telmi Perez, and I am a community organizer. Um, I've worked in South Central and Watts for the last decade. I'm about working um, with the Latino and black community, trying to help foster um, the building of bridges and communication. Um, Working in Jordan Downs the last couple of years, wherein residents called my organization, um, the LA Human Right to Housing Collective, to help work on evictions. Um, it's been an interesting, um, if not uh, difficult, road for a lot of residents to try to help, to try to build relationships with the neighbors, where we have a CSP program that instead of what in theory it's supposed to be doing, in theory it's a great program. But what it's doing, and what I've witnessed it's doing in talking to residents, both black and brown, is creating a culture of fear and of snitching, encouraging residents to call hotlines on each other. When residents have issues with each other instead of talking to each other, they call that hotline and they say, hey, I saw my neighbor with, an, with a weapon. And then what happens? LAPD shows up with the housing authority investigators, pounding down on doors and embarrassing, humiliating residents, forcing their way in when there is no search warrant, where there's no 48-hour notice given by the housing authority to enter that home, and searching people's homes, leading to evictions oftentimes for, little, for ridiculous things like observing drug paraphernalia, where there wasn't an arrest, there wasn't a confiscation of the drug paraphernalia, there was no evidence that was produced to the resident. So these are real problems. This problem of LAPD helping the housing authority with evictions has got to stop. It was stopped in Lancaster, Hakola, and the Sheriff's Department were both sued. The Department of Justice investigated and were found to be in violation of Fourth Amendment rights of residents in Lancaster who were living in Section 8 housing. Um, the other thing, the issue that residents brought up with the ticketing is why are police officers giving parking tickets? Don't we have the Department of Transportation to do that? Why are police officers out there having cars towed and giving parking tickets when they're supposed to be helping to foster better relationships in the community? Thank you. Good evening, Reverend James I. Jones, Jr., better known in the community as Reverend J.J., founder of Gangsters for Christ. And I'm just here to say basically what I really stood up to, to, to speak on was on our, our team. I'm going to get back to the basic in, in a minute, but I would be remiss if I just didn't say, because somebody brought it up earlier, community, if you're not involved, I'm talking about all the way around. Don't come, don't, do not be spewing things out of the community that you don't really know anything about dealing with just one or two instances. We have come a long, long way. In 30 years I've been out here in the community dealing, we've come a long, long way. And most of it, we need to give the Southeast, uh, Southeast LAPD a hand for what have they been doing in the community, and not only them, but all the advocates that we've had. I don't want to start naming a bunch of names because I really came up here to say something that really is dear to my heart. I saw during uh, Charlie Beck's last reappointment, the, the, the some of the abuse that he went through and what he took, but being the man he is, he'll never tell you, and he'll never say, well, I can get up here and really tell you about him. He'll never throw anybody else under the bus. He's going to be, he, I've been knowing him for over 20 years, a man of his word, the first chief that I've known that I can uh, honestly say that, I, as a matter of fact, I don't, it is not but one other chief that I, I think I've ever had a handshake with on camera, 
but I love this man because he's an advocate for the people, for the people in our community. And when I hear somebody get on, on TV talking about who's standing one of them so-called good uh, zip codes, I don't see him out here. Well, okay, well he's not over there fighting dog poop, poop on the on the on the yard. But I guarantee you see him when he gave him where, where the gunshots is going, where he's very where it's very neat, where it's necessary more needed. I'm just saying this, the truth don't change. Just tell the truth, either you're an advocate or your adversary in this community. Either, you, either you're for the people or you're against it. We, it. But do not try to, don't, uh, in other words, what I'm saying, don't get out of here trying to promote your, your whatever those, those uh, idiosyncrasies that you got going on. The truth does not change. Thank you, uh, sir. Charlie Beck, keep on doing what you've been doing. We love you and we're behind you. And the final three speakers are Naomi, Leslie Mendoza, and Sandra Reyes. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Sandra Reyes, and there is a topic that um, I think a lot of us are forgetting. Um, I have been seeing a lot of more prostitution going on. Um, I have been seeing more cars parked in front of our houses. Um, doing illegal activities. Um, we have called the cops and they do take a while to obviously, you know, uh, come and, and see what we are talking about. By the time they get here, it's pretty much, uh, they're gone. Um, and some of the, I was, what I was uh, telling my fiance was um, by kind of taking all this, um, all these problems away, maybe we can make District 9 a permit parking where instead of the police officers coming out and doing, you know, figuring out where is this coming, this, these cars are being parked or anything like that, we could actually have the parking enforcement, you know, doing their, what they're supposed to be doing. Um, I know a lot of you know people wouldn't understand or and would want for it to become par permanent parking, but I think it could eliminate some of the issues that we have now. So that's one of us. And patrolling definitely have more patrol cars to um, to eliminate the prostitution. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Naomi Haywood. I'm with the National African American Parent Union. And I was wondering today, why is it that the, the police department is the one that's doing the community building instead of building leaders to lead in the community and build? Because once the programs for the police officers are over and they're gone, then where are the people if they're not lost because their leaders are no longer there? So why not build leaders in the community instead of building the community in the police department. That's one thing. Another thing is that the, the, the spots that you have set up for game bangers, these spots like on 80, 83rd Street in Avalon, where it's a target place for people that wear red or blue. And if you see these people in red or blue, these people are targets. They don't have a name. They don't have a face. They're targeted because of their the colors that they're wearing. And these same police are not the police we hear about in the, in, the, in, in the developments, in the projects. The police that we see outside the projects are the police that we deal with every day. These ones that we hear about shooting down and everything, that we deal with those every day. So do we start the same program in the whole community or do everybody need to move to Jordan Down? How do we have communication in South Central? Everybody ain't poor and low income. That's it. Hello, um, my name is Leslie Mendoza. I'm actually a youth organizer with the You Just Coalition, but not only am I a youth organizer, I'm also a young person in Los Angeles, a young colored woman in Los Angeles. And you know, growing up in the city is very hard, especially um, when you grow up in an abusive home with an abusive father, an alcoholic father. Um, my mom would call the police multiple times. They would never show up until she was on the floor bleeding. There's always, there's always been that constant fear of having police in our communities, in our streets, especially in our schools. Um, one that today I had is that I got stopped for a tardy stop, being five minutes um, late to my honors English class. And they, 
They put me in the cafeteria room with two other students. They took my backpack, they cleaned it out, they threw it on the floor. They made me shake my bra out because they thought I had drugs. Because I was a Hispanic girl. Every time I would leave school, I would see them stopping and frisking black and brown young men and calling them racist remarks. I think that not only should we have civilian um, oversight in our communities, but maybe start having student oversight in our schools because our students know what's going on. I went to YGC, I graduated. I'm now a medical assistant in the making because one issue that we have here too is healthcare. What's with the healthcare? Our poor young black and brown young people aren't getting the healthcare they need. And that's something maybe we should start looking into. Thank you. Thank you. We are now on item number eight. Um, closing remarks, Mr. President. I just want to thank everyone, everyone for coming and telling us what we can do for you and just as important, telling us what you can do for each other and what you can do for the LAPD. Thank you very much. Um, come to one of our meetings every Tuesday morning. Meeting adjourned. Oh, we have motion a motion for adjournment. Motion to adjourn. Second? Second. All in favor? Thank you, everyone.